The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. Welcome, everybody. You hear me? Dooby 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 dooby. Yes. <laughs> there we are. Okay. Too loud now, or is it okay? Maybe a little louder. Victor, yeah, yeah. Better like this? Yeah. Yeah, so welcome, everybody. What I'm wanting to do with you today is uh, kind of try to get a clear idea of what Vipassana meditation is about. And um, in order to do that, yeah, I'm going to go through, take a little journey in time. We start with uh, modern day Vipassana practice. Then I'm going back in time, tracking that to a scheme of insight knowledges. And then I go back all the way to the early discourses. And uh, for my presentation to work, I actually, I need your help. I need your cooperation. All alone, I can't do it, you see. In the first part, I'm going to introduce the three most wide-known meditation masters from Burma, Mahasi, Sayadaw, Goenka, and uh, Paok. And I'll just briefly tell you what I know about them, but I'm sure many of you have practical experiences. So it would be really lovely if after my short introduction you would be willing to expand on what I say, share your experience, your ideas, whatever practical experience you had. At this stage, uh, it would not yet be the time for criticism of these traditions or of what I'm saying. That is, we can do that at the end. In this first part right now, I just want us to get a feeling for these three traditions. So, we have that mic somewhere, no? Yeah. So, uh, it would be really lovely. Ah, there's two microphones, wonderful. It would be really lovely if you're willing in front of this group to to share your ideas. So, we start with uh, Mahasi Sayadaw. That's um, the first of these inside meditation teachers who became widely known in the West. And uh, the main technique uh, that they use, the Mahasi Masi Sayadaw tradition uses mental labeling. Uh, the Mahasi tradition does not give emphasis to the formal development of tranquility, samatha. And the labeling is applied when, in sitting meditation, is applied to the rise and fall of the abdomen as the main object of practice. And then anything else that happens is also labeled thoughts, whatever other experiences. And the Mahasi tradition has a strong emphasis on walking meditation, usually the alternate between sitting and walking. And the walking meditation also, they use this labeling technique. And I believe they separate each step into four different phases, which they correlate with the four elements. And one of the powerful aspects of this technique is that they get a very clear grasp on intention, the intention that precedes anything that happens, any action that we do. Yeah, that's a little I know. So at this point, uh, if any of you... I know there's one Mahasi practitioner there in the corner. (laughs) (laughs) If any of you could, like, uh, add something on top of what I said, that would be really lovely. Don't leave me sitting alone here. Yes, please. Uh, so the practice that I have done uh, with the San Jose Sangha, uh, Mahasi Sangha's mm-hmm. uh, offshoot, uh, we pretty much have to be mindful from the opening of our eyes in the morning mm. to closing of our eyes at mm. night and doing daily practices, also washing, mm. uh, eating, every little action is broken down into subparts and noted. Mm. And any intention, as you said, wanting yeah. to eat, wanting to eat, etc. Yeah, very powerful, this continuity of mindfulness that they emphasize. Thank you very much. What I appreciate about the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition in my very limited experience, uh, initially when I started to read Mahasi Sayadaw's uh, 
short books uh, was the precision and the clarity mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. which, the, the, the clear intellectual power with mm -hmm. which he describes the practice and the mm -hmm. purpose of practice. So I thought that was very important yeah. for me. Yeah. I would make, I, I would use a slightly different word than labeling. I would say noting. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a very subtle difference there, but regardless. Uh, labeling feels a little more active, whereas noting feels a little bit more mm -hmm. a part of awareness. And, mm -hmm. and the actual words can be left aside. Um, mm -hmm. Label really implies a word. Mm -hmm. Noting doesn't have to have a word. Very good. But very again, good. it's very subtle. And it's maybe no, but just it's a my good experience. Point to make. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, I think it's clear in the practice, again, from my own understanding, is that um, seeing the three properties of uh, impermanence, suffering, mm -hmm. and not self are a very important part of that practice. Yeah. And, and there's the idea that it can be achieved within question of weeks or months initial mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. of those so uh, three aspects of ourselves mm. of our existence thank you very much yeah that was actually a very good point that from the gross labeling that the beginner might do the practice moves more and more into a dropping of the concept that just bear noting thank you very much any other But, but it, it, the, the, the point I'm, I'm just trying to make in this comparison is that they do not dedicate time specifically to the development of samatha. They, they have this, the, the idea of this karnika samadhi, the moment-by-moment -moment concentration by being mindful. But that, but that concentration is very important, but it follows, yeah. it follows in the wake of uh, the mindfulness. Yeah. But it's a very intense concentration, and, uh, and so they, uh, that's an important part of that tradition. Yeah, thank you. Right, we go to the next one. So the next uh, tradition that uh, spread to the West is uh, uh, S.N. Goenka who, and his teacher Uba Kin. And the Goenka uh, tradition, the normal standard setup is they do these 10-day retreats where three days are given to the development of uh, samatha, to mental concentration. And the uh, next six days are given to insight meditation. I think the last day they do loving kindness. And the meditation technique is based on a kind of scanning of the body to feel sensations and to experience their impermanent nature. Again, any of you with any experience of the Goenka tradition, if you can add something on top of that. Goenka, yes, please. And then... He uh, taught a technique of of, um, of body flow, sensations mm -hmm. in the body, and taught a, a method of paying attention. You know, of increasing that. Um, you know how to move from place to place yeah, in the yeah, body yeah, yeah. and all that. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady here, and then at the back. Okay. Um, well, yes, as you said, uh, the three first days you go into the you know, Mindful respiration yeah. to calm the mind, and then you go through the body sensations. And the last goal is to just dissolve your body mm. practically. Yeah. So to feel all these little, you know, tiny kalapas, mm -hmm. as you yeah, said, yeah. you know, and um, it's very intense and it's, it's great. Yeah. It's really good. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, directly behind you, the Indian lady. Um, I, also, I also did some um, 
uh, retreats with Goenkaji and um, G's group. And what I noticed was as they really put emphasis that you move quickly through your body, mm -hmm. um, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, mm -hmm, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I realized that I was able to let go of my attachment to my body much more easily there mm -hmm. than in the Mahasi tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so um, at least having experience of these two traditions, I feel that um, only when you do it, you realize that many more aspects mm -hmm. uh, come through than you would imagine by the sheer description of it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Good, then I go to the next one. That is Pauk Sayadong. He's the most recent, and at present he is uh, very successful. And Pauk Sayadaw gives a lot of emphasis to the formal development of samatha, to concentration. Ideally, all the different kamatanas described in the Visuddhi Magha should be developed up to the level of four jhanas. And his vipassana technique is based on the four elements. The four elements standing for four basic qualities of matter, hardness, cohesion, temperature, and motion. And these are experienced in the body. And eventually, uh, the technique is meant to lead to uh, experiencing uh, the, the most finest parts of the body and even the subtle moments of uh, the mind according to the Abhidharma system, the mind moments. Again, anybody with practical experience can add anything on top of that. I think he's right now at uh, IMS teaching a three-month retreat. Yeah. A little bit far away to ask him. I just came from there. That's a very good explanation. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> good, then we go ahead. So now, if I look at these three traditions, I find there are quite a number of differences. And one of these differences, uh, if we look at them in terms of Satipatthana meditation, where do we locate them? And I'm locating Mahasi Sayadaw under postures. Here I'm following Brahmanyana Ponika. The Mahasi tradition itself, and Jill, you correct me if I'm saying something wrong, actually say that they are observing the air element out of the four elements when they do the rise and fall. But uh, according to my personal understanding, that doesn't really work so well because the point of the contemplation of the four elements is uh, to divide into four, not to pick out one of these elements. So I find that uh, the best I can find as a match is following Venomanyana Ponika, who says uh, that the contemplation of postures and the clear awareness of that is, uh, is the best place to locate Mahasi Sayadaw. And Goenka, obviously, feeling, contemplation of feeling, and pa-oxide, or the elements. So if we speak in terms of Satipatthana meditation, these three traditions are fairly clear, picking different objects. And if you look at the form and development of mental tranquility, as Jill rightly said, Mahasi Sayadaw has that moment-to-moment -moment concentration, but they do not allocate special time for the development of mental tranquility apart from the vipassana practice. Goenka gives some space to it, and Paoxida gives quite a lot of space to it. And this is a rather much discussed issue in the Theravada tradition, how much emphasis needs to be given to mental tranquility, how much to vipassana. So within that spectrum, we again find that these three traditions take uh, rather different positions. You know, it always fascinated me that I, I have friends practicing in all three of these traditions. And when we meet as monks and we discuss our practice, it seems that it all comes together to pretty much similar experiences. And so basically the talk I'm giving today is based on that, on that kind of like, what is the common thing among these three? And I find the common thing to be and now I come to the second of my topic, the so-called scheme of insight knowledge, the vipassana jnana. This insight knowledge, as we now move back in time, terms of time, the 
we are in the around the 12th century uh, work called Abhidhamata Sangaha, a handbook of Abhidharma. And this 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 work is of uh, rather central importance for Burmese. Burmese Buddhism gives a lot of emphasis to Abhidharma, but for them Abhidharma is not the canonical Abhidharma, but rather this particular manual. And it is interesting that the beginning of lay meditation as a mass movement, a very central figure in Burma for that is Lady Sayadaw. And I don't want to narrow the whole history of lay meditation down to Lady Sayadaw. There were also others like Mingun Sayadaw. But Lady Sayadaw had a rather key role in that whole situation. We are in Burma at the turn of the century. The British occupation, the fear of Buddhism is getting lost. The idea when Buddhism is going to get lost, the first thing that will disappear is the Abhidharma. So what Lady Sayadaw did is he wanted to strengthen Buddhism in the country by encouraging laity to know and study the Abhidharma. And he did that through this Abhidhamata Sangha. He created this Abhidhamata Sangha study groups all over Burma. And out of that, in order for them to also put these Abhidhamma teachings into practice, he started to get them meditating. So I find that very interesting. There's a very nice PhD in, in Harvard University from 2008 by uh, what is it, Eric Brown on Lady Sayadaw. And at that time, reading that PhD, I realized that connection, that this, 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 what stands at the background to some extent of this mass phenomena of lay meditation, which we all probably are quite aware of and affected by, is actually an attempt to understand Abhidharma. And that makes us also understand why many Vipassana teachers approach the practice through the glasses of Abhidharma. They look at the sutras from the perspective of the Abhidhamata Sangaha. They don't take the sutras on their own. For me, that was kind of a key understanding. So let us look what the Abhidhamata Sangha has to say on insight. There's a scheme of ten insight knowledges according to the Abhidhamata Sangaha. We have the same also in the Visuddhi Magga, where the set of ten is preceded by two knowledges, Pachya Parigara and Nama Rupa Paricheda, basically, um, simply said, a basic understanding of causality and in some way a distinction between the mental and the physical aspects of myself. These are the precondition for this series of experiences to take place. Now, lists are always problematic. You're probably all aware of that. It's not really that you work one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, you got it. It's more kind of there's a certain basic dynamics that this listing is trying to tell us, which in actual practice will never exactly happen in that way. Nevertheless, lists are also useful to give us some general idea of what's happening. So... If we just look at it from the perspective of meditation practice, number one, comprehension, a basic appreciation of the three characteristics in meditative practice, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not-self. Out of that, the Udaya Bhayanyana, rise and fall. That's a key experience. Experiencing myself, body and mind, without any exception as something that is impermanent, something that arises and passes away. And this is the main working ground for Vipassana meditation. And it's, a, it's not that easy because uh, we often have it that meditators do experience body passing away and part of the mind, but there's some more often that feeling of that which knows impermanence being cozy little stable thing. So everything else is passing away, passing away, but there's this this very nice thing that I'm sitting back and that experience of knowing that change. And it's very, very important to catch out that part because when that moves, things really are moving. Then really Vipassana starts when everything is moving. Is it not working? Can you hear me all? Yeah, I don't want you to miss out on that. I'm saying that um, when, when I teach Vipassana meditation, one of the key points that I always try to get meditators to progress is that 
it is fairly possible to see body and most of the mind passing away. But that which is aware of change, it feels like a cozy little thing you lean back to. Ah, oh, it's so nice, everything is passing away, and you're flowing with the flow, it's all so nice. But when you catch out that one, it's like I'm losing the support, and everything is passing away. Then it's really getting. And that is a, that is a really key thing. And once the experience of impermanence has become comprehensive in this way, then it's another thing, you start a slight shift of perspective. You don't see rise and fall, you just see fall. It is a little bit like, like you're, standing, you're standing by a road or somewhere and you see cars coming, going, coming, going, coming, going. And at some point you just turn, just keep going, going, going. It's just a shift of perspective. The practice is exactly the same, object is the same, but there's a shift of perspective. Sometimes it happens naturally, sometimes we encourage it, that everything passes, passes, chum, chum, chum. And you get the experience of dissolution. Everything is dissolving. Everything is falling apart. The whole world, as we experience it so far, is going to pieces. What happens next? Fear. (laughs) (laughs) What's happening? And this is perfectly fine. Fear is part of the process. We are entitled to that fear because it's a fearful experience. And that is usually the dynamics you work through, rise and fall, comprehensive rise and fall, disappearing fear. And the amount of fear that there is is a very good measurement for the amount of holding on that we have. And when I deal with meditators in that stage, I usually tell them to have metta towards that fear, to accept that fear, because it's part of the process. And the fear is closely related to the understanding of disadvantage, adina, what seemed so secure before. Now we see it's dangerous, actually. And out of that seeing of danger, there comes this beautiful nimbida, disenchantment, no longer being enchanted by these things in the outside world. Of course, we know it's all unstable. And the wish for something that is stable liberation. And when you've gone through that dynamics, there comes a stage where the three characteristics are very, very clear, reflection, and there's equanimity. Very deep equanimity. And in that, if that previous momentum of letting go and seeing of the other inside knowledge is strong enough and carries through that level of equanimity, then the breakthrough can happen. Anuloma jnana, the mind is getting ready, and next come path and fruit, the experience of nirvana, stream entry. Maybe I stop shortly at this point and ask if there's any question, because from now on, I'll move into other systems that describe the same type of experience, but perhaps at this point, if there's any question on these basic dynamics, of insight that this scheme describes. Yes. Would you just clarify number five again, disadvantage? What do you mean by the disadvantage? Uh, do you know, um, that's usually part, in, in the suttas we have them as three, there's three things I can see in everything, there's the asada, that which gives me pleasure, which is nice about it, but there's also a problem with it, and that's the adino, the danger, literally translated, and then there's the nisarna, how you get out of this duality between, it's nice, but there's a problem with it, and that is the basic sense behind that. Basically, there's uh, the, 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 the danger that before our whole way of experiencing and acting was based on the assumption of something stable. I am here, I'm experiencing these things out there, I'm enjoying them, I'm rejecting them, and the basis for this whole interaction since being born until now, and perhaps even in past lives, is dissolving. 
the house is built on sand, not on a firm foundation. And one suddenly realizes the danger of that situation. I have a better understanding now. <laughs> There's somebody there at the back and then the lady over there. Yeah, when I give talks, those who have the mic, they get a lot of jogging to do. Could you expand a little more on the dissolution of awareness? See the that? dissolution of awareness, uh, number three. Could you expand on that a little bit more? There's, there's some different interpretations of that. My understanding is uh, that it is mainly the disappearing aspect of the thing that you have seen before as rise and fall. Excuse me. I think in the Goenka tradition, they have a slightly different understanding. They say that's when the, the, the compactness of the body dissolves and you experience the entire body in terms of uh, changing kalapas, which I think is also fine. The, 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 uh, the basic point is that you see that things are disappearing, that they are dissolving. Think. Uh, something about that which is aware of all of this disappears. I, I find it difficult to hear you. Can Did you, you mention me? something about what is aware of all of this, that, was, that that dissolves as well? That was what I was saying before, that we need to catch out that which is aware as a process in order for our understanding of impermanence to be comprehensive. That which is aware doing meditation is not a stable entity. It is just a mental process. And if we see it as a stable entity, we're going the wrong way. It's very important. Because it's easy to see it as a stable entity. But if you've caught that point, even, even deep jhana will not be a problem. You will not latch on to the experience of the jhana as a something. Because you know it's a process. And only a process can experience. If this fella is totally stable, it can't have any experience because experience itself is change. It cannot understand anything. Even saying a word and you hearing the word must be change. Otherwise you couldn't hear the word, I couldn't say it. That is logic. Seeing it in experience is the second thing. Once you've seen it, you move ahead. But that's not specifically the question of dissolution. It's just the, the need to be very clear that impermanence means everything. Everything. <laughs> there was a lady here, I think. Um, is it sufficient to have uh, experiences of rise and fall and dissolution only during meditation with eyes closed? Or is that something one needs to experience even walking around, eating, doing daily practices for breakthrough through higher nine, eight, nine, and 10 and further? Well, the usual context where these inside knowledge is developed, the power to lead you to stream it would be during formal meditation. But some of them can be so powerful they carry on into everyday life. And they can sometimes, for people who are not prepared to that, they can be even so powerful that they don't know how to stop it. I had a friend, an Austrian, and he had never ever meditated, and he did a retreat not in the Goenka tradition, but there's another branch uh, student of Ubakin, a lady, I forget the name right now. And so he's, he comes from a Christian background, doesn't know anything about Buddhism, does this thing, and gets these very strong knowledges. And he said, Anali, I never drank before in my life, but I went home and I had a whole bottle of whiskey. I just wanted it to stop. Could you say more about number 10? I didn't hear what you said. Number 10 is just the moment when the mind gets ready for the breakthrough to stream entry. And that is a, is a tricky transition there. That the same holds also for getting into a jhana. The mind that is on the brink of the breakthrough has to completely let go. It has to let... You, you're with me? It has... 
It has to completely let go of the meditation to let it just be natural. It's a very difficult point. Same we have in jhana. You build up concentration, build up concentration. If you keep building, 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 you never get there. There's a certain point where you have to let go and just below you get in. And it's the same here. If you stay with equanimity and you have that dynamic and you are making yourself or the experience something too prominent at that point, you're not getting it. But there's a moment of letting go and then you go in. And that is what this anuloma, according to my understanding, is about. And conformity, to, to allow the mind to conform to the situation or something of that type so that the breakthrough can happen. There's a lady here. Could you say a little bit more about number eight, reflection? Could you say a little bit more about reflection? That process? Reflection is the, sim, very similar to number one, only that it has that maturity of the practice by having gone through the early experiences. Right, no more question, then we go ahead. Now you have just seen this nice system of ten, and I'm going to tease you with some other system. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Here we are, Vimutti Maga. What's the Vimutti Maga? Vimutti Maga is a work preserved only in Chinese, and we know a lot what we don't know about it. <laughs> some scholars say it belongs to a monastery called Abayagiri, which was, uh, there was a little problem in Sri Lanka between the Mahavihara, which is the place where Buddha Gosu was staying, the Abhagayagiri. So some scholars were speculating that this must be a work from the Abhagayagiri Vihara, but closer inspection shows this is not conclusive. Some say it's from Sri Lanka, some say it's from India. Again, we don't know. What we do know, it is earlier than Visuddhimagga. And what we also know, Buddha Gosu was aware of it. And the interesting thing is our Vimutti Maga gives the same scheme as you maybe already noticed in a shorter version. It's not, you see the same ten are there, but it's only six steps. Some are brought together. And as we go further back, now we are back to the Pali Canon, Patisambhida Maga. Patisambhida Maga, we don't really know when it was composed. Scholars go from the 3rd century BC to the 2nd century AC. Patisambhida Maga is actually uh, Abhidharma, which was too late to be included in the canonical Abhidharma collection. Therefore, it found its placing in the 5th Nikaya, in the Kodaka Nikaya. It's a great manual for meditators. It's a central reference point for meditators in the, in the Theravada tradition. Lo and behold, only five. Getting more condensed. So we see how, how, how these, the, 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 the key things are still there. There is the basic comprehension, the rise and fall, the dissolution. Then we get fear and disadvantage together. And the wish for deliverance and the equanimity come also together. Can go back one more and just have a look again. So basically what this tells us, again, as I said before, the list is not something to be latched on. It's just giving us one description. This is another description. This is another description. They're just different descriptions of basically the same process. So as I have the authority from uh, the Muti Maga and Patisambhida Maga to, to make it less, I'm going to make it even more less. This is Anali, you know, don't trust him. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to bring it down to the three characteristics. That's actually what I'm really wanting to talk about today. The three characteristics. That's according to my understanding, the essence of insight meditation. The three characteristics. And if I correlate them with the insight knowledges, first one, before I start getting into details, I'm not saying that anyone is only like this or only like this. I'm just saying there is a certain, a certain basic flavor we get. 
So from having seen all three characteristics, we first move predominantly into impermanence. And that is the basic working ground. And then from impermanence, we get more in towards unsatisfactoriness, that whole, how shall we call it, that whole emotional process that is part of the development of insight. That letting go, that detachment, that fear, that disenchantment, that disillusion, all this. There's an emotional process that has to take part, place, for Vipassana to happen. And I put all this under unsatisfactoriness, that the realization that there is no satisfaction in these things. <clears throat> and then towards the end, we get more leaning towards not-self, the equanimity, the conformity, and obviously with the experience of nirvana. That is the confirmation of not-self. As I said, I'm not saying uh, uh, from two to three you're doing only impermanence, don't look at anything else, or there you're doing only dukkha, don't look at anything else. I'm only saying that there's a basic dynamic that goes to these inside knowledges. And this same basic dynamic, and now we come to the third of the three topics, is something we often find in the suttas, the three characteristics building on each other. This basic idea that we see that everything is impermanent. Because it is impermanent, it cannot give us lasting satisfaction. Because it cannot give us lasting satisfaction, it is not self, because the idea of self is something that should be lasting and giving satisfaction. We have different passages in the canon for that. One is, there's a series of sanyas. Sanitya sanya, perception of impermanence followed by aniche dukkha sanya. Aniche is locative. In the impermanent perception of what is unsatisfactory, dukkhe anatta sanya. In what is unsatisfactory, perception of not-self. And the grammatical construction of this series makes it very clear that there is not a change of the object. It's the same thing that I'm looking at from three different perspectives. I see it as impermanent, I see the same thing as unsatisfactory, and I realize it's not self. And it's the same teaching that we find also in quite a number of discourses. Then we get the kind of a catechism on the five aggregates. So they work through the five aggregates, and it's always like, uh, rupang, nichangva, nichangva, body, is it permanent or impermanent? These are actually guided meditations in the suttas. And the monks say, Anichang bande, venerable sir, impermanent. Yang pananichang, dukkang va, tang sukkang va. What is impermanent? Is it dukkha or is it sukkha? And the monks say, bande, dukkha. Yang pananichang, dukkang viparinama dhammang, kallang nu tang samanupasitung. E tang mama, e suham asmi, e sumiyatati. What is impermanent? Unsatisfactory of a nature to change. Is it really appropriate to look at that as, oh, this is mine, this I am, this myself? And the monk said, no, Bhante. <laughs> so we, we see this, this progression through the three characteristics all through the suttas. And I think that is, according to my personal understanding, the essence of insight. Impermanence, the comprehensive experience of impermanence, the working on the disappearance aspect until we come to the understanding of dukkha. And from the understanding of dukkha, we come to letting go of all identification, my making, I making, with everything. And in order to give you a little visual idea of what I'm talking about, this is the... Banga, this is the disappearing. Everything is changing. Not only is it changing, it's kind of pulling me in. Or tearing things away from me. And from that we get the... That is Dukkha. Dukkha is not, ah, oh, suffering, suffering. No, no, no. It's just like the leaves on the tree become dry and, and they fall. We let go of things. And there they lie. And then comes not-self. 
emptiness. Thank you very much for your attention. Time for question and answers. I think it was number... Oh, sorry. This way. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, there we go. (laughs) Um, On your first list... It's up here. Oh, yes. Um, Number nine, I was wondering about the relationship between Upeka and the formations. That's, That's the expression they use that you are equanimous towards whatever happens. And sankhara here has the very general meaning of anything that is compounded. Shall we go back to not-self? No. That's a nice one, yeah, I love that one. <laughs> I wish I could take out all those planets and lights that would be even better, but, but then you wouldn't know what I'm showing, you know? <laughs> hmm. Yes, please. Um, if this question is all right, and I, I leave this to you, um, I would be very interested, and perhaps others would as well, in hearing what your own practice is, has come to be. I, I, the three characteristics. Okay, and, and how do you go about doing that in daily life? In daily life, I don't, or, do, or in I don't do vipassana meditation. I okay. practice metta in daily life. Mm. I, I have loving kindness. Actually, I don't like loving kindness. Benevolence is much better. Metta, <laughs> metta meditation is my main samatha practice. Uh-huh. And this is what I use for every day. Mm. I try to, to uh, be towards whatever happens with an open mind and a friendly attitude. That is my day-to-day mm. practice. Mm. And when I do Vipassana meditation, I, 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 I base myself on a practice of the Goenka type, but the technical aspect quit, pretty much falls to the background and I merely go for the characteristics. And... Uh, my practice is very simple. I don't like it to be complicated. I just sit and I just see impermanence and I see that for a long time. And then it moves to uh, letting go. I, I like viraga, not so much dukkha. Viraga is a, is a very nice term, viraga. We have that in uh, Anapanasati Sutta, the part. There's the uh, anicca and then comes viraga, niroda, patinisaga, viraga. It has this passing away thing, and it also has this dispassion mm. kind of thing, and the two combine. Raga actually also means color, coloring. So it's like putting a beautiful, colorful thing out in the sun, at least in Sri Lanka, but you have a lot of sun here in California. Also, and after a month, you see how, how the color disappears, and you get disenchanted with it. It was so beautiful before, but now it's just a kind of dirty piece of cloth that you're not really excited about. All, all this is in Viraga. So for me, viraga is the term that really, that really gets me going, yeah. yeah and then there's the, the total letting go. That's the not-self part. Not latching on to anything. No I, no me, no mine. And just letting go, letting go, letting go. And I don't even think about these. These are just basic feelings that, 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 that pervade the experience. It's pretty much non-conceptual. I mean, if I have to talk about it, I have to couch it in these terms. Yeah, that's just my way. <laughs> I love simplicity. Yeah, <laughs> a lovely question. <laughs> um, microphone joggers, move here in front. Hi, um, I have a question about the the three main. I have a question about the the three modern day inside, the three teachers. Yeah. Are there techniques, um, do they chose the techniques from the sutras? And is there, is just a, a liking of a, some aspect of the sutra that 
made them choose that technique uh, because it seems like, you know, I go to Goenka, that's my main practice. Um, and, um, but there is a, some message of uh, this is the right way. And uh, it's now that I'm getting the, to know more the sutra, I have many questions about, you know, what makes some people choose some technique, which part of yeah, the sutra yeah, yeah, that yeah. comes. I understand. There's, there's two, two things I would like to say to this. Well, maybe first, what I was trying to show is the historical framework which in which these traditions grow up and why they look at certain things. I mean, Kalapas not found in the suttas. So why does he use Kalapas? Because they come from this Abhidhamata Sangha perspective. That was what I was trying to say with Lady Saido. And why this emphasis on the four elements? Kalapas is closely related to the elements. Mahasi has the elements in the walking and even tries to interpret this. And Pahok is pure elements because Lady Saido was talking a lot about the four elements. I'm just trying to show the historical antecedents that lead to a certain type of interpretation. And it is from that perspective then that these teachers approach the suttas. And they, they read, I mean, the, the other way how Goenka will read the Satipatthana Sutta is probably quite different from the way Mahasi will read it. The same text. It is perfectly fine. And now I'm coming to the second thing, and this is something, and maybe somebody of you can answer that to me, this is something I totally do not understand, why not only advanced meditators, but even meditation teachers, think that what they do is the only right thing and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> I simply don't... It seems to me like kindergarten, you know? Like, what I got is better than yours, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I fail to understand that. Why can you not do Goenka and I do Mahasi and we're both happy? That's just what suits me and I'm so wonderful to hear how you do it and how interesting. I realize it can be done in another way, but I can still do it my way. Why? I don't understand that. If any of you has any comment on that, I would be very grateful because that bugs me for years now. <laughs> not precisely this aspect. I was just trying to understand what is the interpretation because actually when you go to the Satipatthana study at Goenka, we are using your book. That's how I was not talking about you, sister. Um. No, 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 no. I was not talking about you. You were just quoting a certain attitude. I was totally not talking about you. I was, I was just talking. I have friends, monks, who do very intensive practice. And as soon as they come out, they want to tell me that what they have done is the only right thing, and what I'm doing is completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You wanted to say something. Can you pass on the mic? I'm not sure of the value of this question, but I just, something to... Oh, oh. It's pointed. <laughs> it's right there. I have a soft voice, so I'll try. Um, I'm not, just, this question, I'm not sure of its value, so for what it's worth. Um, you had said that the three characteristics were the essence of Vipassana, or the essence of Vipassana is the three characteristics. Yeah, that is uh, my, my perspective. Right. And I just wonder how you would respond to this thought. The essence of Vipassana is liberation, and the three characteristics create the raft. Ah, oh, you're wonderful. <laughs> Lovely. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> you're very precise, even before that, with the labeling. I really appreciate that. Well done. I've read your book twice. <laughs> oh, I've got to be careful now. <laughs> After, after we come to him. Okay. So I just have a, a comment um, <clears throat> regarding uh, Pawak Sayadaw. While he emphasizes samatha in the beginning, if a meditator comes and wants to do vipassana, he will teach vipassana through the gateway of the four elements immediately. Right, right. So a meditator doesn't have to do jhanas or... Mm. I just wanted to make that clarification. And they believe that such a meditator can reach stream entry? Well, I can't tell you what they believe, but my understanding is that he teaches samatha mm. to stabilize the mind so yeah. that the vipassana will be 
more effective. Yeah. But if people really do not want to do that practice, um, he will teach four element meditation yeah, yeah. and try mm. to enter it through that doorway. So one is not compelled to do samatha mm. if they don't want mm. to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to your slide. The one, your, Which one you want? Uh, let's see. That one, yes. Um, I had heard some teachings where teachers say that the final entry point into Nibbana is, a comp is occasioned by an insight into one of the three characteristics. Yeah. And so in a sense, I like how you start with comprehension as sort of a maybe conceptual is not the right word, but a preliminary understanding of the three characteristics. And then maybe at the final point, you could enter into through any one of the three characteristics or the final point. And, Definitely. And then I've heard also that that corresponds, and I don't know whether it really matters at that point. You're just, it's not something you're thinking about, but it corresponds to your final attachment, be it if you're, if you're, fundamentally and finally attached to wisdom, you'll enter through not-self. Uh, uh -huh. Fundamentally attached to samadhi or samatha, the calmness, you'll enter through dukkha. Uh -huh. And uh, through devotion, you'll enter through impermanence. And I just offer that as uh, something that I've read and wondered if you had any comment on it. Thank you again. This last correlation is not known to me. And I would have to reflect on that to, to be able to make any meaningful comment. But the other one, the point, uh, the way I understand it is basically the Nibbana experience itself is a cessation experience. But how do you experience it? As a nimitta, or a panihita, or sunyata? These are the three doors to liberation. And, 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 and that, that, that reflects on your character to some extent. The connection I read about for the last one, devotion and impermanence. Devotion would be sadda or faith? Faith, yeah, mm -hmm. faith and devotion is because there's a, fun, there's, a, there's a tendency sometimes with faith to expect to return. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of a, you know, the corrupting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. influence there that uh, if you're attaching to a return, then you would enter through impermanence because you would see that there is, there's going to be... I, I, don't, I can't explain it exactly, but there's a yeah, sense yeah, yeah. that you're not going to get a return, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. a sense, and that's the final knowledge you have to carry into the experience. Of do, do you remember where you read this? Because it, I've it, never come across this before. It was a, uh, it was a, a, a lay teacher, uh, and I've forgotten his name, but I read it in a book up at the okay. library at Abayagiri. I'd be happy to look for it. And actually, I, could, I, I know exactly where it is in their library, so I can send it. <laughs> Let's go. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be there again. I'm happy to send it right. all, all along. Yeah, yeah it's, this is completely new to me, so I would have to reflect on that to, to see if, if, if that makes sense or not. I can't, I can't say anything offhand. I really hate to speak about technique when so many senior practitioners are here, let alone Gil. But I will speak from my understanding in regard to the Mahasi Sayadaw practice. Mm -hmm. um, it's my understanding, and I've heard it sp spoken by a teacher who I respect in the tradition, actually last week um, at Spirit Rock, that there, there is not an intention to experience elements per se as, oh, I'm experiencing uh, fire, or, oh, that's wind. Mm -hmm. um, and then I could, my own interpretation of that is when I follow the rise and fall, distension is something that I can experience. It's a sensation. Mm -hmm. And it is um, in the present moment. Mm -hmm. But this is my understanding. Mm -hmm. It's, for me, it seems like there needs to be a conceptual leap to then go, oh, that's wind. Mm -hmm. And when I make that leap, if I were to make that leap, and if I, I think if I were to intentionally do it consistently in my practice, I think I would really be in concept mm -hmm. and not in the true experience in the present moment of what's occurring in the body. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, um, I think an analogy to that, or perhaps another instance of that, we often talk about the uh, the pain in our knees. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was mentioned the idea that initially we experience the body perhaps anatomically, like oh my belly is rising, mm -hmm. or oh that's my knee that's hurting. But then as we look more carefully at the sensations, we see uh, perhaps burning or stinging or heat or however you may experience that w which is going on in your knee. So it's not my understanding that there is this intention to sort of categorize our experience or see our experience as elements. You know, I, I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. I'm not sure in what direction we are going now. You, my understanding from one of the slides was that there was this categorization of the three different teachers. Yeah, and Mahasi I, I said was that sort of mentioned elements. Postures. I had put him under postures following very well Nana Pornica. Oh, okay. Because this categorization was based on the basic exercise used. And the Mahasi tradition says that rise and fall of the abdomen is an observation of the wind element. And uh, I'm saying that, uh, uh, that the problem was that when Mahasi started to move from the traditional place for mindfulness of breathing here, then some traditional monks stood up and criticized him quite strongly for that because uh, this is already, um, this is in uh, suttas, it's just called parimukha, and uh, that term is relatively open, but already with the Vibhanga, second book in, Abhidhamma, in the Abhidharma canon, it said Nasika Mugacha. Nasika Mukanimitacha. Okay, the, 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 the nose, the nostril, and the, the upper part of the mouth. So there's a very precise location. And in terms of our tradition and things, that is the place where you should do mindfulness of breathing. So when they start to do it here, there's, there's, there's a conflict with the traditional understanding. And in order to avoid that conflict, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the interpretation was proposed, okay, we are not doing mindfulness of breathing. We are observing the wind element out of the four elements. This is how I was explained that this interpretation came about. But then, to my understanding, it doesn't work because the contemplation of the four elements, we get the simile of a butcher. Cow has been slaughtered and cut up into pieces. The butcher doesn't no longer look at it as cow, but as this and that type of beef. The idea of the four elements is to separate ourselves into different parts, not to take out one of these elements and observe it. Which is why I then said, let's, let's follow Venvanyana Ponika. Where do I have it? There, there. And put Mahasi Sado under postures. I'm not saying he's only doing postures. I'm not saying that's the only way. I'm just, I was just trying to put him somewhere to show the different approaches. Yeah, I, I, it didn't make any... I mean, I understand what you're saying. It mm -hmm. seems like you know, the, the nostril supposedly became too, too, too uh, subtle, really, to be a persistent object is something that I've heard. But I, I just don't understand... And it's not so important that I do understand how Mahasi Sayadaw winds up as postures, but that's fine. That's Nyana Ponika saying, because they do a lot of walking meditation, and this, this is what, what somebody here said it before, that continuity of mindfulness, being aware of everything you do, and that fits very much with the basic idea of contemplation of postures, which gives that idea of continuity in whatever you do, that strong... You said that about the continuity of mindfulness, even working for the kind of concentration part. Okay, no, And uh, I see. there's a, some lady over here. I don't, yeah, you did it. Yeah, thank you. This monk has no memory, I'm sorry. <laughs> So that is why Nyana Ponika put it there. And I find that uh, if I have to put Mahasi somewhere, I find that very convincing argument. Okay. The other thing you said about the, the, the using categories, and I just, uh, we, we recently, in, in August, we had this uh, mindfulness con conference uh, in Hamburg, and the whole topic was this Kabat-Zinn and this mindfulness-based stress reduction and the idea of mindfulness they have. And we had uh, scientists from different areas and also uh, scholars, and we also tried to get Gil there, but he didn't want to come. He wanted to stay with all of you. <laughs> and we had a very nice discussion, and what came very clearly out is that the understanding of mindfulness as non-conceptual is not supported by the canon. 
Mindfulness does not mean, oh, no concepts, no concepts, just be aware, just be aware. Satipatthana Sutta very clearly says, recognize pleasant feeling. Sukkang Vedang Vidyamana, Sukkang Vedang, they give, they give quotation marks in, in Pali. Sukkang Vedang, I feel happy feeling, I feel uh, pleasant feeling, sorry, unpleasant feeling. So uh, the wise use of concepts is part of mindfulness practice. That should be very clear. It doesn't mean blah, 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 tomorrow I'm going to meet my friend and then I'm going to go here. And Not that, not that automatism, the mind running on its own. But the deliberate use of concepts and even of evaluation, this is a worldly feeling. This is an unworldly feeling. This body is not beautiful. I am having anger in my mind. I am having lust in my mind. This is part of mindfulness practice according to early Buddhism. I don't disagree at all with what you're saying there. I was there, just but, using but, the occasion yeah. to get this out. Oh, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think that means that, you know, uh, fire, fire, fire is what we're supposed to note when we have pain in our knee, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, I, I was just using you as a, to, to, to get this out. <laughs> I think it's important to get it out. <laughs> yeah. Can you pass on the mic? I'm hoping you could give a bit more historical perspective, uh, either with these three teachers or before them, in the changing views of the balance between knowing an intellectual scheme versus the pure experience. Um, this has come to light for me because I've studied with Gil for five or six years, reading the suttas, digging into this part intellectually, and then watching my father near the end of his life, who has intuited the three characteristics. Who? My father, who is... Um, a, on his way to dying soon. And just in his own experience, with no Buddhist study, hasn't even listened much to what I've been doing the past few years, mm -hmm. he's intuited the three characteristics. I doubt he'll reach liberation, but he's uh, come a long way. And so I'm curious what has been the sweep of history in Buddhism of how one should teach. Is it uh, what had been the relative balance of teaching meditation as experience and practice versus study of suttas or other schemes? It seems that we have very, very little information about meditation going from the 19th century back. Pretty much we, we, we don't really know what happened. We have the impression that some monks by themselves may have been practicing. But it seems that while it is very clear that early Buddhism, the time of the Buddha, and I would say the first two centuries afterwards, the emphasis was on meditation, and lay people were meditating, uh, there was a stronger move towards scriptural knowledge. And that seems to have taken over. But we don't really know, because we simply don't have sources. We don't have much knowledge about that. And... Um, I myself, when I had just become a monk in Thailand in 1990, and I, I thought, oh, type of Bodhidharma kind of thing, no scriptures, leave me alone, I'm just going to practice. And so I, I lived there, very beautiful, there was a, a mountain, on top of the mountain there was a cave, and on three sides there was a seaside, and I just had to go down to the village Pindapar to get my food, go up, and I'm meditating, 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 but nothing really happened. I was not as clever as your father, you see. <laughs> And then somebody gave me Jnana Ponika's Heart of Buddhist Meditation. That made the whole difference for me. And this is why I'm not even become a scholar. I mean, this may be going a little bit too far. <laughs> but um, I think uh, there must have been a reason why the Buddha gave so many discourses. Why, not, why didn't he just say, hey, psht, sit, that's it. And now the... The image I have is like when you want to make bread, so you have the dough, no? And you're kneading the dough, but you also need yeast. And the kneading of the dough is the practice of meditation, but the yeast is the knowledge of the suttas that makes it go all into a real bread of understanding. That is the simile I like to use for that. Microphone juggles move. Um, thank you very much. I, I have a question and I hesitate a little bit to ask because I'm going to have to say something about my personal uh, experience. 
And so I'll stop right here and ask you if it is okay for me to ask this question or should I ask you one on one? It is up to you. Okay. All right. I don't mind. Um, so, s certain experience of uh, in impermanence, I did have fear arising, especially following Bhanga, I had fear arising. But there were certain experiences of impermanence where I realized that the mind and body are processes. It was actually I just, it was just joy. Yeah. So is that, is that because I have read so much or conceptual? I didn't feel that. Mm -hmm. It felt like it was a lifting of a burden. Yeah. And then following that, another experience of impermanence was, um, it wasn't so much impermanence as in the processes just go on. There is no stop button. Yeah. And that was um, real experience of suffering. So felt like, oh my, I really, like, I wanted to find that shut off switch. <laughs> you know, it was just like, there yeah. was no escape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I realized there was no escape even when I slept because there were dreams. Yeah, very good. Um, so I had never heard of anybody talk about um, the joy part yeah. of it. And yeah. so I was wondering if that was more conceptual or there was, it was wrong or just common. It was perfectly right, sister. Joy okay. is a fact of awakening. Joy is so important. Yato yato samasati kandhana ngurayabhayang labati piti pamojang ammatang tang vijanatang. As one sees with mindfulness the rise and fall of the aggregates, one gets piti pamoja, happiness and bliss. And one will come to see the deathless. And what's the third That is a Dhammapada verse. Joy is the most important thing in meditation. Absolutely crucial. Unworldly joy, not the worldly type. Absolutely crucial. So if you have joy when seeing impermanence, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I'm curious about your recent comment about mindfulness involving knowing what's happening. I'm, my experience is there's a difference between this kind of knowing and what's translated as conceiving usually, like in the, the first sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya where, you know, what not conceiving these things. And conceiving is more related to clinging. That's manyati. Uh-huh. That's a different term. Okay. Patavi manyati, patavi ya manyati, patavi uh -huh. meti manyati. One conceptualizes earth, I am earth, this is my earth. Right. Mulapariyaya, beautiful. So it has, okay, but I'm just, I just wanted to clarify in mindfulness. I mean, you talked about your own practice as being non-conceptual. and uh, Pretty much non-conceptual. I'm just saying that there is no need to be afraid of concepts. Right. I'm, you're perfectly right. right. This Mulapariyaya right. kind of uh, right. rummaging in the mind about things and, ah, oh, this is my glass and blah, blah, blah. This is mm -hmm. not what we want. Right. But at the right moment, to sharpen clarity of understanding, just this. Yes. That's perfectly fine. Okay. And it's deliberate. I've chosen to call this impermanent or, or dukkha. It's not something that I'm just being pulled away by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a deliberate choice I'm saying. Within my meditation, I, it is perfectly fine to say pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, neutral feeling, etc. Right. But not, ah, tomorrow morning, well, I don't know, I have a flight, I don't know what is Gil giving right. me for breakfast, I would like to have something nice, I hope he remembers, blah, 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 blah. No, that right. one. Right. You got the point, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you think that sutta is referring to that? that yeah, manyati, very clearly. The term is manyati, manyana, that, 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 has an under, that has a very negative connotation. Mm -hmm. It has the I involved in it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. It's a beautiful way how it so shows the construction of I mm -hmm. by relating to the object in different uh, yes. cases in the right. Pali. It's very beautiful, very powerful right. center. Right. right, thank you. Anybody interested, Bhikkhu Bodhi has given some talks on that. They're very good. Mm. 
Looks like we're coming to the end. Yeah. Yeah. So, thanks to all of you for the attention. I enjoyed talking a little bit about Vipassana with you, and I wish all of you well. May you be happy and healthy, and may all of you progress on the path to liberation. Thank you. Time for tea.